Hello there, COP. Welcome to our online evening service. It's so good to be with you right now this evening as we get to worship our Lord together and look into his beautiful word with one another. Let's start off as always reading Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent, you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. For our praise moment, we are going to Psalm 132, and we are going to read verses 8 and 9. Arise, O Lord, and come to your resting place. What is the resting place of the Lord? Everybody say, I am. I am the resting place of the Lord. I am his temple, right? You and the ark of your might. May your priests be clothed with righteousness, and may your saints sing for joy. Now, Psalm 132, if you read the whole psalm, it's divided into two sections. And you could call it the oath that David swore to the Lord. That's from verse 2. And then later from verse 11, the oath that the Lord swore to David. David made a promise to God. God made a promise to David. David built God's house. God built David's house. Or David had that desire, at least, to build God's house. So this prayer, may your priests be clothed with salvation and your saints sing for joy. This is part of the first part of the psalm. It's the prayer half of the psalm. It's like the first part is the prayer half and the second half is the answer half. It's when God answers. And that is really a beautiful, beautiful thing. Okay. Are you a priest of the Lord? I remember when I first asked that question to people at, well, then it was Old Bethel. Now it's COP, Cathedral of Praise. And people would go, priest? I'm not a priest. Are you a priest? They're looking for the caller. But we are the New Testament priesthood of God. Isn't that right? We are a royal priesthood commissioned by God to minister to him and on his behalf to other people. So in the first half of the psalm, may your priests be clothed with righteousness May your saints sing for joy, or that is in verse 9. Where is the corresponding answer when God starts answering in the answer part of the psalm? It's in verse 16. And what does it say? What does God say? Her priests, I will clothe with salvation. 
and her saints will ever shout for joy. Wow, did you notice that? How similar is the wording of the request and the wording of God's answer later on in the answer section? How similar is the wording? It's almost exact, isn't it? It's almost exact. The words that were prayed to the Lord, those are the exact words that God said, I will do this. Well, for one thing that tells you that because it's almost exact, that this became like the chorus of the song, because these are songs to be sung in church. And if we were structurally analyzing this psalm, then we could say that's a chorus because it's repeated, something that was sung over and over. But for our purposes in this praise moment, I want you to see it this way. It is a great reminder for us to be very specific when we talk to the Lord. Be very specific when we ask things from the Lord, because almost exactly the prayer, may your priests be clothed with righteousness, may they ever sing for joy. It's almost exactly the answer. I will clothe her priests with salvation, and they will ever sing for joy, shout for joy in God's presence, almost exactly. How many blessings do you and your family miss out on because you didn't ask God? Ask and you will receive. Ask and you will receive. And ask specifically, Lord, in our family, we really need a new car. Can you give us one of those? And then state it specifically. Lord, in our family, our child is about to need tuition for the next year of school. Lord, would you give us exactly this amount because we want this amount for the tuition and we need this much for his allowance or whatever, whatever. Let's be very specific with the Lord. And so now that you're thinking of yourself as a priest, what are the two things that are being fulfilled in your life every day? Number one, you are clothed with salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ, not by works, lest any man should boast, but you are clothed with salvation. And number two, you will ever sing for joy. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> no matter the circumstances in your life, you will find yourself singing for the joy of the Lord. Amen. It's such a privilege to serve our God. Such a privilege. Thank God he clothes us with salvation. Well, right now we're going to get a little opportunity to do some of that singing for joy. So let's all stand up together, lift up our hands, open our hearts, open our mouths, and sing out loud for joy in the Lord. Amen.
Tonight, as we turn our attention again to 1 Corinthians, we're learning what church life is like. What is it really like to be a part of a local church? Let's, let's take off the rose-colored glasses. Let's, let's take off the, oh, isn't it wonderful, and the super spirituality. And what was it really like to be part of the New Testament church then, and forgive me, part of church today? We've started in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy, together with all those everywhere who call in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus, for in him you were enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. So as we're getting started in the book of 1 Corinthians, we, we need to understand Paul's introduction. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. We need to understand who this man is in their lives, their, their spiritual father. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 15, Paul said, even though you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, he said, you'll have a lot of people who will speak to your life, a lot of people who will watch over you. He said, you do not have many fathers. You may not have one spiritual father, but he said, you won't have many. For in Christ, I became your spiritual father through the gospel. There is this beautiful relationship of, of, of a spiritual father, but we don't become that through business. We become that through the gospel. So Paul and Sosthenes write this letter together. We saw that Sosthenes was a former persecutor of Paul, and now these two men are teamed up, two former persecutors writing to the church of Corinth. We began to look at who these people are in the city of Corinth. We, we talked about the city and the people of the city. We, we learned that these were basically freedmen, former slaves, soldiers and tradesmen who had been emptied out of Rome by Julius Caesar, and sent to rebuild this city that had laid completely dormant and destroyed for over 100 years. And we learned that they built it into, forgive me, the wealthiest city per capita in the Roman Empire. So these people were extremely socially mobile. These people really knew that if you worked hard, you could become wealthy, and we saw why. It was this trans-shipping point between the Corinth Gulf and the Saronic Gulf. It was the gateway to the Middle East. It was the gateway to what they called Asia. And then we began to study about the spiritual influences of the city. We, we saw the horrible influences of Aphrodite, who had her temple up on the Acrocorinth and would send prostitutes down into the city every night. And part of people's spiritual worship was to pay to have sex with a prostitute in the evenings. And that was considered an act of worship with these priestess prostitutes, all right? So it was a difficult situation. We, we saw that Paul wrote the letter for three purposes. First, to clear up misunderstandings from his last letter. Secondly, to answer a multitude of questions that they had. And then thirdly, because of the report of Cholese people about the division and hostility among them. So now, let's take it a step farther and come back to verse 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and our brother Sosthenes. Who is this man who he says in 1 Corinthians 4.15, I became your spiritual father through the gospel. Who is this man? So Paul begins a declaration of who he is. He, he doesn't define himself the way other people would define themselves, especially in their upwardly mobile, so socially conscious, society-focused people. He says, Paul, now, he doesn't say Saul, that would be the name of a former king of Israel. He doesn't say Saul, a name that would give him status and dignity. And really, Paul had obviously come from a wealthy family, Saul of Tarsus, a former member of the Sanhedrin court in Jerusalem, one of the ruling body of the Jews around the world. He, he, he could have used extravagant titles to try to give himself prestige and dignity with these people. Instead, he says, Paul. Now, you got to understand, Paul was a nickname, but it means little one. It literally means little one. And forgive me, 
probably a name of mockery with Paul because he was little. There is an actual description I've read of Paul in Roman history where Paul is called short, bald, and bow-legged, and ugly. Okay, he's called short, ugly, bald, and bow-legged. Bow-legged because he'd, he'd been beaten with rods so many times. It has an effect upon the bone structure, the pain and things. So he's already short, and he calls himself Little One. He identifies himself with a name that, that actually makes fun of his short appearance. He, he's a little self-depreciating. He doesn't feel the need to, well, this is who I am. But there's no big striving with Paul. Secondly, he calls himself called. So short one, called. Now this contrasts with these super apostles that he talks about later in First and Second Corinthians. This, this contrast with these people who promoted themselves, that they were the, the self-called, the self-promoters. He said, called to be an apostle. Galatians 1 verse 15. But when God who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, he said, you know what? I didn't choose this job because I was looking for a job. I, I didn't choose this job. And it's really, job is the wrong word for it. Vocation, calling. You see, when, when a pastor looks upon the ministry is a job just to make money. You should go and sell a Vita, all right? You should go and sell AXA insurance. Uh, but what we do is something that... What I tell young pastors, if you can do anything else, go do it. You, you have to do this because there's a calling burning within your heart. Paul said, I didn't do this because there's any prestige involved in it. I didn't do this because it was a way to earn money or, or to be popular. He said, God, in fact, if anything, it's, it's, it's the most unpopular thing to do and be. We'll see that later. Paul said, I was called to this. Unlike the super apostles that are self-called and, and you know, you, you've gathered them around yourselves. He said, I was called. And he said, I was called to be an apostle. Not the apostle, an apostle. Paul had no problem with recognizing the apostolic calling on other people's lives. In fact, in Romans 16, verse 7, he said, Greet Mary, who worked very hard for you, and greet Adronius and Junius, uh, probably husband and wife, my relatives who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles. And Junius is a female name. Now that, I know, really bugs people, but Junius is a female name. That was a female apostle. Greet Adronicus and Junius, my relatives. He said, you know what? They've, they've been in prison with me. And he said, they are outstanding among the apostles. He said, they're not just a calling of an apostle upon their life. He said, these people are outstanding among the apostles. He said, and they were in Christ before I was. So these are relatives of Paul who were saved before Paul, who also have an apostolic calling upon their life. They're called to the office of an apostle, and they were in Christ before Paul. He said, listen, I'm not the apostle. I am an apostle. Now again, notice this apostleship is a calling. See, Paul didn't see apostle as a title of honor. He saw it as a title of service. He didn't see it as a title that exalted him and, you know, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, the apostle is the highest rank. Folks, there is no ranking in the fivefold ministry. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, there is no ranking. Well, apostle comes first, so it must be the highest. No. They're all equal. They're all giftings that are, are given unto men to serve. It's not a title to exalt. It's not, not the rank. Well, you know, apostles are generals and pastors are, are lieutenants and, and, you know, evangelists are the colonels. No, no, it's not like that. Th these are equal ranks. If you want to even use the word rank, I prefer not to. But Paul said, this is the office that I was called to. 
Now, again, this is not a title of honor. I told you earlier, in fact, Paul said, you know, <laughs> that this, this calling to be an apostle, that this is, this is not something you choose because it's not easy. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 9, Paul said, For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession. Now, now please understand, we don't get this today because we don't travel long distances over dirt roads. But if you are part of a, a procession, like men condemned to die in the arena, if you're at the end of the procession, all the dirt comes back to you. If you're going to be in one of those ancient marches, you want to be in the front of the march. Have you ever noticed on TV when you, you see the ancient kings and stuff going about, the kings are always out front? That's not just because they led into battle. You didn't want to be in the back. That's where all the manure is. That's where all the stuff you walk in from the horses ahead of you. Oh, grabe talaga. And the filth and the dust coming back in your face. Paul said, you know what? I'm at the end of the procession like men condemned to die in the arena. He said, we as apostles have been made a spectacle of the whole universe to angels as well as men. 1 Corinthians 15, 9, Paul said, for I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So Paul did not consider this, this apostolic calling as some big title of honor. He said, you know, to be an apostle, it kind of sucks. He said, we're on display at the end of the procession, like men condemned to die in the arena, and everybody knows the Roman arenas. So at the same time, he, he does a little self-depreciation, short one, called be an apostle. He also doesn't allow people to look down on him, and I like this. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 5, Paul said, I do not think that I am in the least inferior to these super apostles. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. Paul said, you know what? You know, I, I will take the low position. I will take the humble position. But you know what? You're not going to make me think I'm inferior to these people. Now, now this is something pastors go through all the time. <laughs> it's, it's just one of the things I have to work with with young pastors and work on in my own life. When you get criticized all the time and you get put down all the time, you begin to doubt yourself. You begin to think, you know, is there something wrong with me? And you, you see these other people and, and, and they're, you know, they're the super apostles and you think that, ah, I'm parang basura lang, you know, just, and you begin to doubt yourself. Paul said, you know what, you're not going to run around with these people who think they're all that and think that they're always right, and that they're the perfect ones, and, and I'm always wrong, and I'm just, I'm just inferior to these people. Paul said, you know what? You're not going to get me to think that. You're not going to get me to question the call upon my life. You're not going to get me to live in discouragement and despair because of all of your, your put-down words. Paul said, you're not going to do that. He said, you know what? I'll take the humble position, but you're not going to destroy my self-esteem and my self-worth and who I am as an apostle of God in Christ Jesus. And then he says one more thing. Paul, short one, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Paul said, this is not, this is not something I chose. I mean, please forgive me, folks. Paul was an incredible leader. I mean, he was a leader among the Jews. He, he was a member of the Sanhedrin court as a young man comes from no doubt a very wealthy family, trained at the feet of Gamaliel. Paul could have done anything and been anything. But he said, I'm in the ministry because it's the will of God. This is not my will. He said, this is not about social climbing for me. This is not about social climbing in the new thing in town. The, the new thing in town here in Corinth is Christianity. And, and I came in to join the new thing. And he said, no, 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 no. He said, there's no social status climbing here with me. He said, I I'm doing this because it really is the will of God. He says, so, all right, that's who I am. But he said, now, let me talk to you about who I am in your life. And Paul said, I've gotten your attention a little bit about who I am. But he said, now I want to get your attention about who I am 
in your life, why you should listen to me. He said, you've got a lot of voices around you talking right now. You've got these super apostles in your ear telling you how wonderful they are and, and how you should listen to them. But he said, you know, why should you listen to me? He said, I, I've told you who I am, my office and my calling. But he said, now I want to remind you of something else. Look down at verse 6. Well, let's start in verse 4. I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him, and we'll get into that tomorrow night, the whole doctrine of being in Christ, and that's beautiful. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all of your knowledge, because, wow, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. So Paul tells this church in Corinth, you know, when, when Christianity wasn't popular, when there was no money flowing, when I was poor and all of you were poor, Paul said, you know what? My testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 4, I always thank God for you because his grace was given you in Christ Jesus. He said, I've been praying for you, but he said, I did more than that. I spent a lot of time preaching to you. And he said, you know, what I taught you about Christ was confirmed. When I taught you that Christ was Savior, it was confirmed in your life. You got set free from your sins. When I taught you that Christ was Redeemer, that he redeemed you from the curse of the law, that the blessings of Abraham could come into your life, he said, you know what? God confirmed my testimony about Christ. When I taught you how Christ would provide, he said, you know what? That was confirmed. That testimony about Christ was confirmed. He said, when I taught you that Christ was the healer, he said, that testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. He said, everything I testified about Jesus was confirmed in, not just around you, in your life. You got saved you got healed, you got filled with the Holy Ghost, you got touched and blessed, you got prospered. All the things I testified about Christ were confirmed in you. He says, you know why you should listen to me? Because listening to me got you where you are today. Wow, that's a pretty bold statement. Paul said, listening to me. Listening to me, that testimony, everything I taught you about Jesus was confirmed in you. So when you start making decisions about who to listen to, he said, do you just remember what's happened in your life? Mm. Now he goes on. Before he begins, and really here in chapter 1, he's going to start some correction. It'll take us a few weeks to get there, but he's going to start some correction and he's going to start some instruction. But before he can start correction and instruction, he has to remind them of who he is in their life and why they should listen to him and pay attention to him. And Jesus did the same thing. In Matthew 16, verses 13, Jesus said, who do people say that I am? And the apostle said it. He said, all right, now, who do you say that I am? Verse 15. But what about you? Who do you say that I am? Before Jesus could provide instruction and correction, they had to decide who he was in their life. Before Paul could begin construction and correction, they had to decide who he was in their life. Now, when Paul writes this, it's been many years since he founded the church, and there have been many other preachers coming through since then, some good, and some like the super apostles, not so good. So Paul said, you have had a multitude of religious influences in your life, some valid and some not valid. He said, but now, who am I? Am I just one more voice in your life? Or is there something different about my voice in your life? Did I become your spiritual father? Was my testimony about Christ confirmed in you? Or am I just one of the Many voices that you choose and shop around. Let me see if I can. It's like one time I talked with a person, and they just came to sit down and talk with me, and they said, well, this pastor says this, and this pastor says this, and this pastor says this. I want to know what you think. I said, I don't, it doesn't matter what I think. What does the Bible say? 
I said, you're shopping for an opinion that will allow you to do what you want to do. And there are many Christians out there today that this is how they live their life. They, they, don't, they don't grow in the church that God planted them in. They, they look for a preacher, they look for a church that will allow them to live the life that they want to live, not what God called them to live. Well, you know, in this church, they never challenge people about their sins. They, it's just, this is a church for people who, who aren't perfect. We're just a bunch of sinners saved by grace. And it's okay to live in your sin and be in church here. Just be faithful with your tithe. No. Paul says, who am I in your life? Am I the person that became your spiritual father through the gospel? Am I the person that God confirmed my testimony of Christ in your life? Or am I just one of the multitude of voices that are trying to attack, attract your attention with, you know, marketing and advertising and Facebook and Instagram and whatever? Now, now brothers and sisters, before Paul could ever begin instruction and correction, he had to challenge them to make a decision who he was in their life so that they would listen to the right influences. Now, let's just talk practically here for a minute. In this lockdown, there have been really good things that have happened. I think all of us have learned to pray more, which is a beautiful thing. We've learned different ways to evangelize. We, we've, we've seen the faithfulness of God. My goodness, have we seen the faithfulness of God. But one of the difficult things is you get online and you look for a multitude of voices to listen to. And you know what? There's a lot of good preachers out there. There's a lot of good churches out there. There's a lot of good men and women of God that are saying a lot of good things out there. But there's also a bunch that are just really good on video and they don't live the life. This is the problem with lockdown. So without discrediting anybody else, because there are a lot of really good preachers and churches out there, you have to ask yourself the question, are you part of COP? Then who am I in your life? Who is Sister Bev in your life? You think about some of our older pastors, and I don't say that in any way disparagingly, but you think about Pastor Joey and Sister Lanny. You think about Pastor Marlon and Pastor Rose. You think about Pastor Manalo and Pastor Lot. Yet you think about Pastor Cecil, Pastor Paula. You think about Pastor A. You think about Duke. You think about James. You, you think about these people and you go, okay, there's a lot of voices out there to listen to. But who are the voices that I should pay attention to? Who are the people that God has placed in my life to pay attention to? And then you have a decision to make. Before we can instruct you, before we can, can correct you, you have to decide who we are in your life. Otherwise, we're just another voice with every other voice in your life. Have you ever watched children when they get a little lost in a shopping mall and they can't see mommy and daddy and all of a sudden they'll hear a voice and their eyes will brighten up. They know mama's voice. They know dad's voice. They know above all the other voices, there's a voice that they should listen to. In the same way with all these voices, who am I in your life? As your pastor at COP, if God planted you here, who am I in your life? And then you've got decisions to make. Now, I've sat down with people sometimes that have been with us in the church for many years. And their life began to go off in a very different direction. And I sat down with them one day, and you could tell their heart was no longer here. I was no longer pastor in their life. I'm not even sure that they had a pastor anymore in their life. Their whole, you, you could just sit there and feel it. I'm nothing in their life anymore. And you'll find when, when people feel that way toward me, I just back up because there's no point in speaking if someone's not listening. Now, these are thoughts that you have to think about. If you're part of another church and you're listening to me tonight, I'm just one other voice. The most important voice in your life is the pastor that God has placed in your life. 
He's the one that will give an account to God for your soul, not me. So if you're listening to me from another, and you are part of another church, and God has planted you in that other church, the most important voice in your life is not my voice, it's, it's the voice of your pastor. And you should be prioritizing that voice. Ah. You see, folks, God doesn't put one pastor in a city. In a city like Manila, there should be thousands of great churches, thousands and thousands of great churches. But God takes a pastor and puts them with a flock, and the Holy Spirit holds them accountable for that flock. And the people have to decide who that pastor is in their life. Something to think about. We'll see you tomorrow morning, 545 Daniel's Prayer, and then we'll see you at 6 o'clock sharp. We'll see you then. Thank you for going online for tonight's evening service. We hope that you will join Pastors David and Beverly Somerl of the Cathedral of Praise Manila again tomorrow at 7 p.m. You may also join our daily devotions with Pastor David E. Somerl every Monday to Saturday at 6 a.m. Fortress 91 is from Tuesday to Sunday from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. in all Cathedral of Praise campuses. For more information and updates, visit us on facebook.com slash cop.manila.